Welcome everyone for those joining us live and watching the recording. Tonight we're talking about tips and tricks for study and exams. It's always nice to be back with Journal. And tonight, my hope is that you get a couple of principles out of this. I'm going to share sort of nine big ideas, but trickle in a few more as we go through around really practical and actionable things that will get results that you can do when it comes to study and when it comes to exams. So a couple of basic principles that we'll take through everything we're doing tonight. First one, I love this idea of just keeping the main thing the main thing. So if you're doing one task, and this is big, we'll talk about this in time management, just give that 100% of your attention. If you're watching the recording tonight or you're listening in, uh, I would encourage you for the next hour or so just to take the phone, put it on silent, give you the main thing, the main thing, give it your attention. We know that multitasking is a complete myth when it comes to cognitive tasks. So you can walk and you can talk to your mum and you're like, Josh, I'm multitasking. Uh, but it's much harder. You can't talk to your mum and do your emails and post on social media, right? It doesn't work. So keep the main thing, the main thing. The other thing, I love the second concept, safe is a new risky, that the biggest risk is not to take risks. So I'm going to encourage you as you go through tonight to think about some of these approaches as things that are a little bit different. They might run counter to some of the things you've heard before or done before, and they definitely would have if I heard them at the start of university in particular. So keep an eye out for Rushka, R-U-S-H-C-A. I'm going to break six of the biggest myths of what happens with study and then what to do that's even better. Third, give. So one of the things we're going to encourage you to do tonight, this might sound counterintuitive, is to think about how you studying can help other people. Uh, so whether that's study groups, study buddies, posting notes, sharing with others, of course, ethically and not giving away all your answers to your assignments, but thinking about how actually helping other people can be one of the things that helps you the most. So with that, my name's Josh. I'm the founder of Campus Consultancy, and hopefully tonight we can share some really effective tips. Um, given that there's a relatively small group, I'll be talking a lot. So forgive me if from time to time I take a quick sip of water. So first thing we're going to look at is some of the challenges around studying and exams. Now, we know that these things are challenging. We know that they're stressful. And one of the things that I'd encourage you to think about is if you are stressed or you are worried or you are concerned, write it down. Just write it in the middle of the page like a big mind map. And write down, I'm worried about this. I'm stressed about this. I'm feeling this. And then ask yourself, when's a time in your life when you've experienced that before? And how did you handle it? Look back and think about when have I come up against stress or worry or concern before? And what did I do to overcome it? And you can also look at times and say, you know what, when did I not handle that so well? And what can I avoid doing? And that can be valuable too. And finally, you can say, well, what might I do? What could work? What's something that would give me the opposite of that emotion? So if the opposite of fear is feeling safe, you might go, what can I do to feel really safe? I know it sounds strange. But when I was at university and I was stressed about exams, the way I would feel really safe is I'd put on my comfy sweater, I'd close the blinds, I had this study candle. I don't know how to study candle. I had a study candle, a light a candle, I'd have a cup of tea and I'd just put my head down and get it done. Like complete focus. I felt so safe and cuddled up in my room and I'd just hook into a piece of work. And even to this day, right now, and I finished studying 10 years ago this year, it's crazy. I still use that technique. If I'm ever worried or concerned about something, get up early, draw the blinds, I have my candle or my lamp, you know, whatever works. I make a cup of tea, I go through the same process and I just focus on that main thing. So if you're experiencing any fear or worry or concern, it's totally normal, right? Normal, but not ideal. We don't want you feeling that way. There's nothing wrong with feeling that way. We don't want to feel that way if we can avoid it. So just ask yourself, what am I feeling? When have I overcome it? What could I do to overcome it? And then what's the opposite of that emotion and how could I feel it? Feeling nervous? Well, what if I felt excited? Feeling worried? What if I felt joyous? What are the things that you could sprinkle into your day um, to make sure you're feeling the way you want to feel when you're going into study? Now, I'm going to share with you five things that I think all things in life affect everything else. That what's good for study is also really good for your career. And I bet if I asked you, why'd you come to uni? You'd say, well, to study and get it to pass. Okay, great. Or to thrive, you know. Well, why'd you do that? Well, I want to get a degree. Great. Well, why'd you do that? Well, I want to get a job. So if the point of study, ultimately, if you follow the logic chain along is to get a job, why not focus on how studying can get us a job right from the start? And to do that, I'm going to focus on what I call the future five. Now, these are five of the top skills that employers are looking for right now in the Australian workforce. And if you focus in on two of them, resilience and planning and organization, these are two skills that you can really get studying with other people, but studying alone. If you work through a problem, if you plan out your time, you can develop these two skills and they're great things to talk about in job interviews and employers value. But you can develop those as well as three other skills, communication, teamwork, and interpersonal skills, which is like building relationships. If you learn to study with other people, 
And one of the things that benefited my studies and my academics the most when I was at university, right through to getting a first class honors degree, I finished my honors thesis six months in advance, my final year as a president of an engineering club, knocked off my honors thesis, and I worked 36 hours a week, and my grades went and the reason I tell you that is not to impress you or to brag, but to tell you that none of that worked when I was studying alone because I could only use my own level, my own experience, my own patience if I was getting it wrong. So one of the things I'd really encourage you to think about as we go through today is how can you share this video? How can you share this PDF? How can you get it out to your friends and say, hey, what if we tried some of this stuff? And what if we did it together? Because by speaking through your problems with other people, by working on a team to get through parts of problems um, or essays or questions or quizzing each other, which we're going to talk about a lot today, the opposite of Rushka, by the way. And by developing those relationships, you develop some of the top skills employers want. So as a quick hack for today, uh, future five skills, you can get all of them through study, but only you can only get two out of the five studying alone. So really important to know. All right, so I'm gonna share lots of skills with you today. This is what's coming up. I'm gonna give you the slide so you can come back to it, but lots and lots of stuff based on lots and lots of research, hopefully compressed into about an hour or so. So let's run it through tip number one. Hot tip number one, know your outcome. So one of the things I'd encourage you to do, and this is a really coarse, really rough calculation, but I think it's good to keep in mind, normally because it shows you it's possible, is to do a little bit of really quick math around where you're at and where you want to be. So what I'm going to encourage you to do here when you do the little goal calculator is to figure out firstly, what are your average grades? So you might say, my grades right now are a 60 out of 100. You go, okay, great. And roughly, how many hours do you study every week? And I know it changes week to week, but roughly, where are you at? And you go, well, I probably do, you know, two to two and a half hours a day. So let's call that 20 hours. And you go, okay, great. Now, for some of you, might that might be way more. For some of you, it might be way less, right? Let's even get a simpler hour. Let's say one and a half hours a day. So it's 10 hours. You go, look, I study every day. Sometimes I study a couple of days. Sometimes I don't study at all. And I binge it on the weekends, but 60 out of 100, and I study 10 hours a week. The next thing is, what do you want your goal to be? I think you're only limited in life by two things, your goals, your ambition, or your effort. If our effort meets our ambition, we can do amazing things, meets our ambition. We can do amazing things. But if our ambition is huge and our effort is really small, we tend to be disappointed. Likewise, if our goals are really small, but our ambitions, our effort's really big, we get them done quickly and then we're bored. We've got too much time on our hands. And a quick little reframe there, if you're ever bored, ask yourself, is my ambition not big enough? If you're bored on the weekend, go, did I not set a big enough goal this weekend? Because if your goal was to find a new house or find a new job or fall in love, something that takes a little bit of time, I'm guessing you wouldn't be bored by 10 a.m. on a Saturday. So if you're ever bored, it means there's more effort than there is ambition, and you can flip that around. So the next step then is, okay, well, what do we want our average grade to be, which I've got as a G here? What is our goal grade? And you might go, you know what, Josh, I really want to get from a 60 to, I want to get to, let's say, a 72. I want my grade to go up 20% right? I want to just, just add that little bit more and I think I can do it. If I get over a 70, that'll qualify me for an honors degree and that's where I really like to be. Now, again, you can pick anything. You could have picked a 90 here. You could have picked a 61, anything in between. But I'd encourage setting those goals at 10, 20, 30% higher is a good place to start because it'll show you it's possible. So let's say 72, 20% more. Now, if we, our next question then is, well, how much do I need to study to get there? So I'll give you this quick little formula and it basically is just a scaling formula, but it encourages you to figure out how much would be required to get there. And it adds in a factor of safety. Now the factor of safety is designed to get you to do a little bit more than what linearly you'd think you would need based on the fact that often there's a diminishing returns. You don't need to worry about that. Just plug in the formula. So let's see how we go. If we type in 1.2 times, oh, I should, probably should have kept the numbers here. That's all right. We'll see how we go. B was 10 times 10 times one plus goal minus actual, 72 minus 60, divided by actual, divided by 60. We're gonna come out with, this just happens to work out at 12 times 1.2, trust me on that one, equals 12 times 1.2, which roughly works out to 13.3 hours. Now, always round up, so let's call it 14 hours. So what we've got here is the thesis is if we want to go from a 60 to a 72, that we're going to go from 10 to about 14 hours. And you go, Josh, surely that's not possible. But remember, that's every week. That's per week. So if you do that over 10 weeks of a semester, plus a couple of weeks of exam prep, plus a few weeks of exam, say 15 weeks, 
That's 15 weeks times four extra hours equals an extra 60 hours. Now, if you add that up and you think, well, I'm only doing 10 hours a week to start with, you might say that's 50% more, right? Because 10 to 14 is nearly 50%. So that's an extra 60 hours. Now think about this. A university subject is pegged at about 100 hours worth of work. So I've designed and lectured university subjects before. And when you're designing it in terms of course material, homework, et cetera, you get it to where you think it's about 100 hours, roughly. So if you do an extra 60 hours of study, which is just four hours a week, you're doing almost an entire extra university subject worth of work, but you're pointing it at the subjects you have. Hence, the theory is grades go up. Now, you can apply this yourself. It's really, really simple to do, but basically figure out what the percentage increase of your grades is, times it by 1.2. It's going to tell you how much you need to study. Then the uh, next thing I'm going to encourage you to do, hot tip number two, is to track this, is to figure out where I'm at, where I want to be, how much extra time it is, and we'll talk about time management shortly. But the next big thing is to track it. And this is based on a bit of research that came out of Deakin University uh, in 2020. And what the research shared was in just five or so minutes a week, students were able to increase their grades by 17%. Yep, you heard that correct. Their grades went up 17%. So that's like going from a 70 to an 80, roughly, in five minutes or so a week. Here's what they do. What they had to do at the start of the week, roughly, this is, I'd recreated it for a program we ran, but this is roughly what it looked like. The start of the week, one on the left. They said, what's your name? What's your goal for study this week in hours or outcomes or something like that? And then just, yes, I'm committing to achieving this. Then at the end of the week, they said, did I achieve a goal? Yes or no? Did I study the hours I wanted? So say 14 hours from the previous example. And what worked well and what will I do differently next week? So if you say, yes, I studied my 14 hours, what worked well? Well, I was in my bedroom or I went around to a friend's place and we studied together, that worked well. But you might say, what didn't work well? If you only studied two hours and you wanted to study 14, it clearly didn't work. So the art of this is saying, what didn't work? Well, I went on TikTok or YouTube or I was gaming too much. You go, okay, great. So what are you gonna do differently next week? What are you gonna change? And the beauty of this process was, it's not like everyone's grades went up instantly, but when they did this every single week throughout a semester or trimester technically at Deakin, Grades went up 17% just by saying, how much am I going to study? Kind of like making a promise to yourself and then tracking it each week. So as a really simple hack, if you get nothing else out of this session, write down how many goals, hours you want to study, schedule it in your calendar, reflect at the end of the week, keep trying to improve week on week. And remember, we're not trying to do more and more and more. We're just trying to hit the goal. If the goal is 14 hours, then that's what we want to hit. And we want to do that routinely. Third step. We want to schedule time and use our calendars. So I said we talk about time management. Now I'm going to share something that looks like a horror movie in a second. And this is my calendar from a couple of years ago. So don't freak out if it looks kind of crazy. Uh, we're down now. And by the way, this took me years to figure out. Even after I was teaching this sort of stuff, um, I'd done it through uni. I perfected it as a student. But I was building a business at the start. I was working six or seven days a week. Now we've got that down and we've done this routinely, working between three and four days a week for the last two and a half years, two and a half years now. Now, if that's even starting a family, getting married, having a baby, all that kind of stuff, we've still managed to keep it between three and four days a week. So what I'm going to show you looks crazy, but one of the things I want to get through is you don't have to do it like this, but I want to show you what is possible when you really start to think about your time. So this is my crazy calendar, right? Now, the thing I want to show you here is if you don't use a calendar, I encourage you to start. I didn't really start using a calendar like this specifically until my final year of uni when I was really busy. And I learned a really valuable lesson. If you want to get something done, give it to a busy person because a busy person is very quick to say yes or no. And if they say yes, they either do it or they schedule it. So for me, running a business, doing all this stuff, I don't have to-do lists. I have an inbox, which I treat as my to-do list. And I either read the email and write back or don't write back if I don't have to, or I read the email and I schedule it in my calendar for what I'm going to do. So if I know that I want to do something, it's in my calendar. I don't try to remember it. I schedule it. So this week that you see here, one of the things that I've scheduled are all the different color codes. Now, my week didn't look like this at the start of the week because I update things as I go. But what I use it is as a live document. It's on my MacBook, it's on my iPhone. And even though it's Google, it works on Android and, and iOS. It's completely free to use. Now, one of the things that's really important about this is I'm using different colors. So for me, running workshops are bright red. They're the number one priority. What comes next under that? The yellow tasks are the design and the admin. What comes next after that? Not necessarily in priority, are meetings. So all the little purple dots are meetings for me. What comes next after that? A travel and commuting. So this was, um, I think it was actually pre-COVID, this screenshot. This screenshot's from a couple of years ago, which is cool. It's cool to see. 
and all the travel was there. So catching the sky bus, flying to the Gold Coast, um, traveling, commuting, getting in an Uber, all those sorts of things were scheduled and I knew, knew that they were on there. So you'll see Wednesday morning, 728 sky bus scheduled from 7.30 to 8.30, right? Now, anything that needed to get done, including exercise, including self-care, family time, that sort of stuff was on there, as well as like peak social experiences. So you might notice Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I've got dinner with Steph, my wife. And one of the cool things about scheduling that on there was, you know, I don't have to schedule every meal we have together, but we made those things special. If we were going out and seeing friends, if we were doing something in particular, we scheduled them, we made a big deal of them. Now, for you, the red periods might be study and you might not want to study all day, Saturday and Sunday. That makes total sense. You might have a whole day, two, three days, four days where you don't schedule a single thing. But if you are trying to get things done, scheduling it is one of the best ways to do it. Now, I got a little message uh, a couple of years ago from a student who, with permission, let me share it. Uh, and they said, hi, I just wanted to reach out and say thanks for the goal setting sessions. This was at RMIT. I managed to get myself HD for most of the semester with a push from your organizational skills and your calendar. I just wanted to say thanks for helping me at the end of my degree. So this is someone who wasn't getting HDs, who came along. We did a whole session on time management. So we really dug into this uh, for 90 minutes or so, but they put it into practice and it worked. Why does it work? Because all you have in life is time and focus. You can spend an hour at the gym, sitting on the floor texting, no health benefits. You can spend 15 minutes at the gym, really focused and get a big outcome. People say, Josh, should I work harder or smarter? The real answer is both, but it's not harder or smarter in just one area. It's harder and smarter. And this is the key across the main areas of life. I think there's about eight or so, and they'll come up a little bit later in the session. So when we come back to that, I'm going to talk about the concept harder or smarter. And study is one of those things. We want to do both of those. We want to put in the time, but when we're putting in the time, we want to be really focused so we can get the study done and we can move on to hanging out with our friends, sleeping, exercising, et cetera. Cool. Uh, a practical way to start this, by the way, just design your great, a dream day. So today's Wednesday. So if tomorrow was Thursday, for example, if you watch this tomorrow and the next day is Friday, et cetera, just think about how the day you want to have the day that's best for you. So for me, I know that at the well, now it's changed because I'm up at 6 a.m. with a little baby, but a great day is waking up at say 7 a.m. I love that feeling. And so for me to get to wake up at 7 a.m., I know at the very latest, I need to be asleep by about 10 p.m. because I like about nine hours. So from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., this is just for me, but I'm sharing it with you. Uh, I'm sleeping. That's what I'm doing. But what that leaves me with is 15 hours of the day. Is that math right? Yeah, 15 hours. So if I'm designing a great day, I'm going through this. And if it's my Thursday for me in here, I'm saying, okay, I want to read for an hour. Then I'm traveling. Then I've got a couple of meetings throughout the middle of the day. Then going to the gym. That I did a TED talk that Thursday. So doing practicing for the TED talk, that's kind of a random thing. Hence it's orange and do that overly often. Uh, and then I've got a dinner. So if I'm designing this day, I might go, this might be dinner, 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 all the way through here. And then this is just like getting ready for bed, right? But I could also jump in there and do a big study shift, do a big work shift. I might say, I want to just have some time off to read and I want to go to class here. The first couple of hours of the morning could be any particular activity but I'm scheduling the day in chunks, just like you saw on the calendar in pieces that make sense so that I know I can tick them off as I go. And the big one for that is study. So remember this tip from above, how much do I want to study? How much am I going to study? Once you've done that, schedule it, put it in your calendar, lock it in and just move other things around it. All right, fourth tip, big one. We talked about this before, get a study buddy. So I think there are four, four different types of study buddy. Three of them are good. Let's start with the one that's not good the one that derails you. So the one that derails you on a performance motivation kind of matrix here, so that's what these uh, sort of axes are, is a low performer who's not motivated. This is someone who doesn't want to do it, who's not doing it. Shocking for study. This is your friend who you go to their room and they're sitting around and they're gaming or they're doing that thing all the time. Not a little bit of the time, all the time. Now, it doesn't mean don't be friends with this person, just minimize study time with this person. If that's your best friend in the world, Go hang out with them if that's what you want to do. If they're the person you want to hang out with, just don't put your study time into that person. And remember, you've got lots of time in the week. If you've got 10 hours for study or 20 hours for study or whatever it is, don't spend those 10 or 20 hours with them because they're going to derail you. So avoid that. And you'll know that it's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just a fair judgment. If someone's not performing, they're not doing well, they don't want to do well, they're complaining about class, they hate their degree, they're not a good person to study with. Cool. Second thing. 
there's sort of people group of people who you can teach. So I've kind of do these in the order that I would suggest. So the ones that you can teach are okay as long as you're still progressing. So they're really motivated. Their performance is just low. So this might be your friend who's studying with you, who's kind of struggling, like they failed a couple of semesters last semester or last trimester, but they say they really want to make an effort. They say, hey, do you want to study together? They're okay to study with. The reason they're okay is you can teach them and teaching other people is a really great way to learn. So the biggest thing, as long as you're progressing, you don't spend all your time, for example, if you're teaching them concepts that were blatantly taught in class, but they didn't go because they were sleeping in, not a great person to study with. If you're teaching them because they went to class and they took notes, but they still don't get it. And maybe you're just a little bit further along, great person because they're keen and they're going to appreciate it. So I'll leave it to you to make that distinction. Third category, people who can teach you. So these people are high performers and they might be high or low motivated. They're not necessarily low motivation. So the matrix doesn't necessarily work there. High performer who's not motivated is someone who's probably just a genius, uh, not overly helpful for you. But let's say the teach you one is, if this one's kind of in like the middle, if I could slide that over. So they're high performers uh, and they're motivated. They're kind of a little bit of both, um, but you'll see the difference here. So this is hard. They're good to motivate you, but bad if they distract you. Um, good people to go to for specific help. In fact, I'm actually going to leave that where that is. I understand what I was thinking now. They're high performers, but they're not as motivated. So think of this as someone who um, is really, really crushing it. They're doing really well, but they don't, it's almost like they, they seem like they don't have to try hard. Like it comes easily to them. They're good if you want specific help. Hey, how do you do this? What's the answer to this? How did you figure this out? And they're like, oh, you just use these three formulas. That's great because they can tell you the answer really quickly. What's likely is I'll tell you the answer really quickly because they're distracted doing something else. Again, not a judgment or a criticism, but like if they've gone to class, if they get it, if they're a year ahead in the degree, it's going to be easy for them. But if they're not someone who seems super motivated or isn't sort of on equal terms with you, the gap might be too hard to breach. Another one for this is if you two just don't get along, they might have the answers, but the motivation to study with you might not be there. So that leaves us for the last category, which is great. This is the best one. And these are people who are really motivated who are performing a little bit above you. Now, what's awesome about this is this is someone that can push you, someone that can encourage you. So I would encourage you wherever you can, maximize time with this person or these people. How do you find these people? I'd be posting in your forums, in your group projects, on your Canvas accounts, going to your lecturer and saying, is there anyone out there who really wants to study together? I'm looking for someone who's got these sort of goals, who wants to get an 80 or above, who's looking to get a higher distinction, and I want to study with you best thing about that is you're going to keep each other accountable. And when I was at uni and I was studying with friends, even though I started studying with people whose grades were higher than mine, both of our grades went up. My grades just went up more. The reason mine went up more was I was starting further behind. So I was starting on like maybe a 70, 75, and they were starting at like mid eighties. So mine jumped up to their level really quickly because we were studying together or close to their level and theirs kept going up. So they kind of fit in that category of teaching me. I was the them in this category they were still progressing. So everything was still good. We had a really great time together. That stuff was awesome. But mine jumped up because I had like almost inbuilt tutors. It was such a hack. It was so helpful. All right, cool. A couple of other things to dig into. Let's look at some myths and the reality. So I said that I'd share with you six myths of things that don't work or don't really work. And then things that really do. So I call this Rushka. Now it's on the other slide, but the reason I want to call it Rushka, and I'll show you why in a sec, is that it's a way to remember it. It's just a, like a mnemonic that sticks in my head. So here are a bunch of things that don't work or they don't work nearly as well as the alternatives. That's worth keeping in mind. Firstly, and these are all things I used to do until I realized that they don't actually work. Firstly, rereading your lecture notes, terrible. Secondly, you underlining, does nothing. Third one, summarizing, really ineffective. H, highlighting, terrible use of time, even though I continue to do it, right? Uh, C, cramming, like just getting it all done at the last moment. And the A, all-nighters. Now, some of you might look at this and go, oh my goodness, Josh, I do all of those things. So did I. Here's the problem with doing those things. Some of them work a little bit initially. So the first four, they work a little bit at the start. So it's beneficial if you do reread something, you don't just read it once. If you underline a couple of key points and then you summarize it or you underline and highlight together normally, and then you summarize it, going through that once is a, is a little bit helpful. But what often happens, and you might have seen this happening, is people keep rereading and summarizing and highlighting and rereading and summarizing and highlighting and underlining. And then they're like summarizing summaries. And like the knowledge is getting so thin that it's not going any deeper. 
So the reason why that's not overly effective is it's not going back and forth in your memory. You're constantly looking at the answer, right? The last two, cramming and all-nighters, terrible and ineffective. They're just absolute myths that people think work and don't. If you've been successful doing these things, congratulations, you're a genius. You've been successful in spite of doing these things. So there are way better techniques out there. But for you, you've got through doing them, which is great because now if you try some of these other techniques I'm going to show you, you're going to be amazed how much further you're going to go. If you still want to reread and underline and summarize and highlight a little bit, that's okay. But there's just way better uses of time and you've only got so much time to do it. That, by the way, is the working smarter, not harder bit. If you work smarter and you study a little bit more, you're going to see the results explode. It's unbelievable. So here's some of the research and some of the science in case you're interested. Um, rereading, underlining, summarizing, highlighting, cramming, all-nighters, none of those things work. Blunt force trauma is one I often include. Uh, this was me, like when I was studying in high school, I had no idea what I was doing. I just had like posters on my roof. I got like big A3 posters and wrote my notes and stuck them above my bed. And I thought that like just looking at them all the time would work. Um, I had a little electric picture frame on my desk that like would cycle through the notes. Problem with both those things is they're passive. I wasn't going back and forth. I wasn't shutting my eyes and quizzing myself um, as you'll learn in a set. Instead, I was just trying to bash it into my head didn't work. Now I still got into uni, it still worked well, but then when I got to uni and learned these new techniques, completely changed. So what does work? What does work in short is called active recall. What active recall is you're going back and forth with your memory to ask yourself questions and try to answer it. So the first step in this is remembering it. I'll talk about this in terms of flip cards. The second thing is connecting it, finding things that match and don't match. And the last thing is applying it, putting it into practice. This was the biggest thing I did at uni was start doing questions and past papers. It absolutely changed the game. It was probably the biggest catalyst to grades improving. So let's talk about how these things work. Cool. All right. Let's do the science first because this is fun and I wish someone told me this. Starting point. Let's do a really simple metaphor first and then I'll do the brain and then I'll go back to the metaphor. So here's the metaphor. Imagine you're trying to learn, you're doing a physics course. And you can't upload the whole textbook onto a thumb drive um, or onto think of like a limited file size on an email, something like that. Um, but if you did lots of little doses of the thumb drive, you could eventually upload it to a hard drive. Now, if you went to class one day, filled up a thumb drive with information and then didn't upload it and went back to class the next day, you're either not going to have space for the new thing or you have to delete the old thing and add the new thing before you can get it onto the thumb drive. So the key sort of metaphor here is that thumb drive is how your short-term memory works. Your short-term memory, given a short term, can only remember recent things. It's why you have no idea what you had for breakfast on the 26th of April last year. You have no idea what you might've even watched on Netflix last night. You're gonna watch it again tonight. Like we don't remember those things from the past. We might not even remember, you won't remember the first word I said today. Like, did he say hello? Like you don't remember those things because in the short term, we take in all the information, we can understand it, but then there's an uploading process where we determine, is this important? And are we using information in a way? And are we sort of treating our memory and using techniques in a way that gets it to upload? Now, one of the ways our body does this, especially if we see something that has a really strong emotion to it, if something's really funny or something's really scary, um, or there's something that um, has a really strong impact on us, our brain will remember it because we're like, well, that's emotionally intense. And one of the most intense things we remember is fear, especially fear around stress and anxiety and concern. So what we don't want is to study with those techniques. We don't want the thing that we do to upload into our memory to be fear-based because then the next time exams roll around, you're terrified because your body's like, oh, I've been through this before. This is terrifying. Whereas it shouldn't be if you've used the techniques effectively. So how that actually works is you go to class, you take in information through your eyes and your ears. It goes to a part of your brain called the hippocampus. That's like a USB. That's short-term memory. Then the kicker, when you sleep, it uploads to your long-term memory. So the reason why cramming and all-nighters don't work is cramming doesn't work because there's only so much you can get on that little short-term memory before it maxes out and you literally need to upload it before you can put more in, hence sleep. Second reason why all-nighters don't work is as soon as you have shortage of sleep, you limit the amount of upload potential. Think of like not sleeping as having a terrible Wi-Fi connection. You've got the information there. You know you want to upload it. You can't because you're like stressed and anxious. You know how you feel kind of slow if you're not sleeping? That's literally what it does to our brain. And we can't, if we can't get that deep sleep, that proper sleep, um, REM, REM sleep's when we dream. If you've ever heard of like REM sleep, that's when you dream. 
NREM sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep is when you're not dreaming, that's when you're like, think of it like uploading to the hard drive. So what you want to do to set yourself up for success for studying exams is be in the most relaxed state for your sleep possible to give yourself the most access to sleep possible within reason. And then be in a position where you've learned enough that day that there's something to upload, but you haven't burnt yourself out to the point that there's too much. So sleep's good for everything. If I can't emphasize that enough, um, one thing that I'd love to, to stress, this was like a game changer for me. A lot of this is from Matt Walker's Why We Sleep book. This one was like one of my favorite stats that a single night of four hours sleep knocked off 70% of the natural killer cells in your body. And their job is literally to kill cancer and tumor. So if you're like, I'm going to cram the night before my exam and get two hours of sleep, congratulations, you've killed 70% of the cells in your body that stop you getting cancers and tumors, which is terrifying. And when I speak to university students all the time, one of the biggest things they talk about is how they're not getting enough sleep. So really, really, really strongly recommend to cut something out of life, whether it's Netflix, Instagram, whatever it happens to be, cut or limit that out so you get the sleep. And that alone is going to do amazing things to your memory as well as your overall health. Anyway, if you want more on why we sleep, check out the uh, TED Talk or the summaries in the slides, which I'll send out today. So if those are the myths, what's the reality? What actually works? Three things. Remember, apply, and connect. Here's how they work. So the first one is, and I'll, the slides are here so you can dig into them more in more detail. Remember, so what we want to do, the first point, is rather than just have the information go passively in, we want to go back and forth with it. So an app that I really recommend you use is called Anki App Flashcards. It's completely free. You can do lots of cool and fun things with them. But what's so interesting about it is it you can type in the question and think of it as a back and a front. Now, once you create it, you can have a guess, answer it on the back and say whether you got it right or you got it wrong. Now, the cool thing it does down the bottom here is the fail, hard, good, easy. If you ask it a question and you get it wrong, then you say fail. It'll get, it's going to give it to you again. If you get it right, be like, oh, that was hard. I kind of had to guess. It's going to give it to you a few more times. If you got it right, you were pretty confident, but there was one or two you're iffy on, it'll say, you might say good. And if you got it right and it's super easy, if I said, what's two plus two? You're like, Josh, it's four. You go easy. It's not going to offer you that question again. But what it has built in is this sort of machine, like mechanical input machine learning sort of, where you're telling it, whether it's easy or hard, how long it took to do. And then it's giving you the questions back to make sure you get more access to the things that are difficult and less access to the things that are hard. For example, one of the biggest places students mess up when it comes to study is they study and focus on the things that they're really good at at the start. And then the stuff at the end of the semester with the lectures like pay attention, this is going to be in the exam. They don't study it as much because they've only learned it more recently. They don't understand it as well. Or they do the exact opposite and they forget all about the stuff at the start of the semester trimester, then they get to the exam and they've missed out. So what this does is at the end of the day or at the end of the week, you take the main learnings, you put them into flashcards, it lives there. You can put them into folders, subjects, semesters, weeks, you can do whatever you want with it. And if you want to study a particular thing, you just go through and through and through and it works really, really well. Um, you can be creative. You can do fill in the blanks. You can do multiple choice. Um, it's great. I wish I had it when I was at uni. Um, second thing that we're going to do is, and we're going to dig into this in a little bit more detail in a sec, is the connect and apply. So when it comes to a connect, I really recommend using tools like mind maps. So for example, um, when I'm looking at, this is a workshop that we did relatively recently, when we're looking at different sorts of mind maps, one of the things that's great about it is it lets you represent things visually and in colors, engages a different part of your brain, and it also lets you join and connect things together. So if you're looking at a subject and you map it out into weeks or major themes, or you're researching historical figures and there's 10 of them and there's different events, if you map something out in the mind map, it just gives you a different visual representation. And the kicker with this is every time you go another step further in the mind map, your thinking goes deeper. So if I was to say to you, for example, let's make a mind map around different sorts of food. You might go Italian food, Japanese food, and I go, okay, cool, we're doing cuisine. So let's come up with lots of those. Or you might go breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they go, okay, so we've got those different things there. Well, what could I have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or you might go gluten-free, um, vegetarian, vegan, um, carnivore diet. And you go, okay, so we're doing it by diets. So any way that you split it, your brain's going to connect things that are similar. And then you could go deeper. If you went vegetarian, okay, what's a vegetarian Japanese food? What's a vegetarian sort of pizza? What's a vegetarian uh, meal that you could get at Subway? or at Hungry Jack's or at KFC, that might be kind of challenging, right? 
Or if you're going to cook your own versus order out, what sort of meals would you get? And so by distinguishing them in different ways and then seeing them visually, it helps you go deeper. So that's the connect part. Once you've remembered it, the connect part is trying to draw um, connections between topics. The last part, which is the biggest part, is apply. And when it comes to apply, this is when we're doing questions. Now, these, aren't, these can just be true or false questions, but the best ones to do are past papers, past exams or tutorials. So a quick hack for this, I'd recommend going through all your tutorials or all your questions or pulling them out of the textbook, writing them on individual little cards for a subject, question on the front, answer on the back, and literally turning your tutorials and your subjects and your labs and all those sorts of things into active cards that you can use and that you can apply. Now, this is slightly different than just the remembering the information, because this is where you might use past papers, past exams, where the framings or numbers or examples are slightly different. Okay, cool. Um, I won't do too much on memory tips, but I will give you a couple really quickly. So one thing that you can use, um, mnemonics. So mnemonics is what we had before. This is like Rushka, uh, rereading, underlining, summarizing, highlighting, cramming, or onliners. Now, if you do that five or six times and someone says, watch Rushka, it's really easy to remember, even if it's a made up word. But if I'll say, what were those six factors? They're hard to remember abstractly. So that's what a mnemonic is. Then you've got a memory palace. So what a memory palace is, is you think about a place that you know really, really well. You might even use your bedroom. And then you try to put things in those certain areas. So if you were going to remember, say, five historical figures that you wanted to write about in an essay, and you're in your bedroom, and you had your pillow, your nightstand, um, the standing next to the door, maybe your table and your chair, and you need to remember different people, well, if you can visualize a little version of you know, Gandhi or Martin Luther King sitting on the pillow. And then on next to the teacup, you've got someone else doing a particular thing. It's kind of crazy and ridiculous, but the way a memory palace works is you move through those things because you're so familiar with them. Um, more advanced techniques move through a room, hence it's called a memory palace or move through a house. And you put different things in different places. And you can tell yourself a little story about those things and then go back. And sometimes months or years later, you can go back through them. So I did a TED talk a couple of years ago and I used both of these things. For mnemonics, I called it leadership is service, S-E-R-V-I-C-E. -E, and each of those um, letters had a meaning. So self-awareness, empathy, reading, vision, internal locus of control, curiosity, and empowerment. So I can still remember them today, even though I haven't watched or listened to that TED talk in years. And I made a memory palace. So from where I live to the um, tram stop that I used to catch into work all the time when I lived in Melbourne, I had these seven points along the way. And at each of those points, I had little activities happening in my mind. So when I was on the stage and trying to do the talk and I had to remember these different things, each step along the way, I had different activities. And in my mind, I just took it through this little journey, especially if I got stuck. A couple of others. One's a really good one to do is create your own images or guides or maps. So for example, when I make a little image like this, I'm putting three things together and I'm looking at what happens where things overlap and when they don't. So by creating Venn diagrams or mind maps, they're really good for images. And the last one, metaphors or similarities. So if I was to ask most people, what is the, what, um, is the shape of Italy? So the country of Italy, what does it look like on a map? Most people can tell you it looks like a boot. Why? Because it kind of looks like a boot with a high heel. If I was to say, what shape is Ukraine on a map? You probably don't have a clue. Now, Ukraine's been in the news a hundred times more than Italy's been in the news the last year or two. But because we don't have anything in our mind of like what the shape of the country is, we go, well, why do we, why would we know what that shape is? Whereas you might not hear about Italy for years and someone says, what shape is Italy? Oh, it's the shape of a boot. Why? Because we have a metaphor. We have that image. We have something in our mind that links it. Now, you don't necessarily need to do all of these things, but if it is something you're really trying to remember, some of these techniques can work really well. All right, a couple more. I'm going to give you two or three more, and then we're going to um, give you a little bit of time to put it into practice. So number eight. Number eight is a big one, and it's about focus. I said at the start, what, keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing, the Brendan Bouchard quote. So a big one for this is removing apps or scheduling no screen time. Now, this is some data that's a couple of years old. You'll notice it's from 2018. The numbers have gone up massively. So four or five years ago, people were picking up their phones about 60 times a day and spending about three, and three hours, 15 minutes on it. I was looking at some research this morning from 2023, and it said people spend nearly five hours, four hours and 54 minutes in Australia on their phones every day. Now, that's an obscene amount of time to be looking at something that probably doesn't have your lecture notes on there. 
So one of the most powerful things you can do, if you've got apps on there that you know are distractions, either one, delete them, or if that's too crazy, turn off the notifications and the badges so you don't see any little red circle with a number in it. Turn off anything that um, beeps or buzzes. By default, anything that makes a noise or a visual um, is trying, especially if it makes a noise, it's trying to get in your ear. If it makes a visual, it's trying to get in your eyes, right? If iPhones could make smells, they would, right? The only thing stopping it is the technology. So if you've got something that's getting in your eyes or your ears, it wants something from you. It wants to change how you think, feel, or act. That's literally what they're trying to do. So if you know that your phone is trying to change you, you have to give it permission to change you, quite literally. So you can change the notification permissions. So no sounds, no notifications, or put it on do not disturb or airplane mode so that it does not have permission to change or influence you when you're studying. That one little thing, if you can claw back an hour or so of effort every day and put that into study, you're going to be amazed how much more time you will get. Um, last one I want to give you, and then there's nine little super quick bonus ones, but they're going to be in the slide for you to dig into a little bit later. Um, they're nine little bonuses, but I'm going to finish up on this. Tip number nine, before we get to the nine, is to get up, get started, and schedule chunks of your day to get working. So first thing I'd recommend... Um, this was funny. When I was at university, I'd always wake up at 5.53 in the morning. Now, this was a silly thing to do. The reason we did it was there was a group of us studying together. Like I said, the people who got grades higher than me. And one of the things that they really liked to do was go to the gym. I'm like, okay, great. Let's do that. Now, our gym opened at 6 a.m. And like engineers, we wanted to optimize it. So I lived about six minutes away from the gym. So someone would pick me up uh, or five minutes away, would pick me up and we would go straight there so we could be there when the doors opened. We were engineers. We were dorky and nerdy, but that's what we like to do. So I had this alarm set for 5.53 because I could get out of bed, put my clothes on, run to the door in one minute when my friends were there. And by the time I was downstairs, they were there to pick me up. And especially in Sydney, it was cold in winter uh, and we didn't want to be standing out in the cold. Now, that 5.53 alarm, what that represented to me was getting up, taking action, not making excuses and then getting things done. So I had that alarm. So whenever I'm in doubt, I set that alarm for 5.53. It's funny, actually. I wonder if it's sending my phone right now. No, it's not. Tomorrow I've got my 7 a.m. Beautiful. But I had it for years and I can change the time, right? But I did it for years and years and years. And whenever I'm in doubt, get up just before six, get up just before sunrise and get started. Now, there's a couple of things that I learned from that that I'd share with you today. And I call them 60 time. So the first one, the 60 in you time, is take the first hour of the day to do something good for you. And I encourage you to think here about your mind, your body, something that makes you feel good. Don't make it, you can make it study. There's an argument that you should just get up and get straight into it. I found that something that looks like a morning routine is helpful because I don't hate getting out of bed. Now, if you're super motivated and you can just get out and get straight into work, amazing. When I was at uni, I couldn't do that. I wanted to get up, wake up a little bit and do something. So for me, it was going to the gym. Um, other times in my life, it's been getting up and reading. Um, sometimes we're getting up and doing mindfulness. Sometimes we've been getting up and calling someone because friends in other countries who are awake at that time. But the first hour of the day, I do something that makes you feel good. If studying straight away makes you feel good, love it. But if it's doing something, if it's getting up, getting the body moving, you get all those endorphins going, the body starts kicking in. And by the way, exercise, aerobic or anaerobic, so like things that get your heart rate up or lifting weights, are really, really good for your brain. They release chemicals that help your brain grow and make new connections. So if you can get some exercise in in the day, it has a really positive effect on study. Second thing, 60 and one. So what I learned with 60 and one is get your first and most important thing done in the first free hour you have of the day. So if you know you want to start an assignment tomorrow, wake up, do your thing for an hour. But when that hour is done, start your one thing. If you know that you really need to send a job application tomorrow, get it done first thing in the morning. If you know that you really want to, whatever it happens to be, study a particular subject, Get it done first thing in the morning. And it's amazing how good you feel if the first hour of the day, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you exercise. If by 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., you do your one thing, you get started on something and you've made some progress, by 10 a.m., you've exercised and spent an hour on your number one goal. It's incredible how good you can feel. Now, once you've spent that number one hour, you've still got the rest of the day, right? Lots and lots of time. And that brings us back to the tip before of designing your dream day. So if this is gym or yoga or whatever it is, and then this is you know one hour on assignment due next week, you might jump in here and go, okay, I'm going to have a little break. But maybe after you have a break for an hour, you go, okay, I can keep doing that assignment. And then you do that for another hour or two and you go, oh, I'm going to have lunch now. And then you go out and you see a friend 
And then you with them for, you know, two or three hours. But then you get back an hour before dinner and you go, hmm, I might do another hour on that assignment. I'm feeling good. And what we find is throughout the day, you've managed to stack up three or four hours working on that assignment because you started getting a little bit of momentum. I had a day like this exactly today. I had something I needed to do. I worked on it for an hour. I had two or three breaks throughout the day that I was like, I'm just going to keep working on that. I'm just going to keep working on that. And the result of that is I'm nearly finished this thing after four hours. That's not due for another month. So those impacts that you get from building good habits at uni really trick along into work and into life. Last one, 60 and wrap. This is something that I encourage you to do one hour a week where you sit down and you reflect on how you spent your time. Now, a lot of the time tonight, I've talked about power of time management. It's a really big thing. Why? Because it's the unifier of all people on the planet. Everyone has 168 hours per week. And we all have different lives and different things we have to do. But if you manage to use your 168 hours to the best of your ability, that is literally all you can do. If you sleep eight hours, that gives you 112 hours in the week. So what the 60 and wrap process is, and you'll see that's in my calendar right here for an hour, end of week or EOW reflection is to take an hour per week, sit down and re firstly, the R stands for reflect. Where did I spend my time this week? So if it was a week like this, I would add it all up. How many hours of red? How many hours of purple? How many hours of blue? Add all that up. Second, in the wrap plan A, and it, by the way, this is another mnemonic you might notice. A stands for analyze. So when I'm analyzing, I'm asking three questions. What do I feel good about? What do I not feel good about? So like, what am I spending enough time on? Keep spending time on it. What do I not feel good about that I want to spend less time on? So less time on social media, perhaps. And what do I not feel good about that I want to spend more time on? And what I find is you can only feel good or bad about things. And if you feel bad about something, you can only spend more or less time on it. So most people feel better if they spend less time on social media. Most time feel, people feel better if they spend more time studying. So when I do the analyze step, I say, okay, which are the areas of life that are going good? Which are the areas that are not going good? And how do I reallocate my time? Last step, the P in the wrap process stands for plan. So when I'm planning, I look forward and I plan the next week. So I've showed you today how to do this for a single day. But if you can do it for tomorrow, Thursday, you can do it for Friday. If you can do it for Thursday and Friday, you can do it for next week. And then you get a calendar that looks like this. If you can do it week on week, hence why you do the wrap process every week, then you start to have weeks that are more and more and more efficient. Now, I'm not recommending, again, that you schedule every minute of every day, seven days a week. What I am recommending is that if each week you ask yourself what's working and what's not and what do I want to change, that each week you'll keep getting better. And that's exactly what this research found that said marks went up 17% when students focus every week just for a couple of minutes and set a study goal. Now, as a bonus for today, there are also nine little bonus steps. So if you download the slides, you'll have access to those and you can step through them and see what those nine little steps are. They're all in there for you. Um, but one final thing that I will get you to consider before we wrap up today, tip number 11, is just to think about some time that you can recharge. So I think there are lots of different areas of life that are really important. Uh, I said before, I think there's about eight different areas. I'm gonna share a couple with you today. Um, of course, you've got your academics, but three of the other areas I'd like to highlight are your relationships, your health, and things you do for fun. And one of the biggest mistakes I see students make is they get to exam time, and they have all these great habits about seeing their friends and working out and maybe getting some good sleep and going off and having fun and dinners and exploring Melbourne. And then exams roll around and they stop doing all those things. So I think about who's a person or what's an action you could take in each of these categories to make your weeks fun, especially when you're studying. What most people do is they make their weeks boring when they're studying because they think they're going to bore themselves into action. It's a terrible technique. I like the opposite. So if I'm thinking about things to make me want to study, I'm scheduling time for my health, walking, meditating, reading a book, working out. If I want to make myself study, I'm going to schedule time in the afternoon or the evening, something to look forward to, where I'm going to go see a friend or call home or, you know, if it was you, like going on a date, walking the dog, uh, volunteering, something that you can do that you'd be excited. And if it's, if I'm trying to motivate myself to study, I'm putting something fun in my calendar at the end of the week or the end of the month to look forward to. If I know that I want to go to a new cafe or take a weekend off or plan a holiday, then that's something that at the end of the week, the month, the mid-year break, or the end of year break, you've got something that you're working towards. Because if all you're working towards is finish studying so you can come back next week and study again, that's pretty boring. It's hard to be motivated to do more of something that's difficult. But if you really want to get your study done by tomorrow night so you can have Friday afternoon off and go out and see some friends, 
that's a really good motivation. And you can do those in really healthy ways. So I'd encourage you, if you're looking for that motivation boost, think about relationships, think about health, think about fun. What are the things you can sprinkle in your day or week? What can you put in your calendar to get the most out of your study period? Now, today is a relatively small group, but of course we're recording. Um, that is what we have time for. I hope some of those 11 tips plus nine little bonus tips is a bit of an incentive to download the slides and dig in can be helpful. And as a final activity, something to check out, I'd encourage you to be writing in your notes. Who are three people who can help you with your study? They can be a lecturer. It could be a tutor. It could be someone in journal. It could be someone on your floor or a friend that you have. Who are three people you could go to and talk to about your study goals or your exam goals? Who could you study with? Who could help you out if you get stuck? And if you're not sure, email your lecturers and ask. Email each of your lecturers and go, hey, I really want to build up some more people to support me in my study network. Is there anything you recommend? Some lecturers will say, hey, I can help you out. Most of them will be really busy. They might be able to point you towards a study group or give you some advice. So just think about three people who can help you. And then three other things, I want you to think about three reasons why you should keep working towards those goals. What are you looking forward to? Today, I'm going to study because what? Today, I'm going to study because it moves me towards my career. Today, I'm going to study because I want to be done by tonight so I can see my friends on the weekend. Today, I'm going to study because I know if I get this done this week, then next week, I can have a morning off to do yoga or whatever it happens to be. Think of actions you can take and people who can support you. And when you put people in mode and actions together, you get a really motivated student to study. And remember, all of this goes back to what do you actually want to achieve? If you just want, want the grades to go up 5 or 10%, great. As long as your ambition matches that, you'll get there. And if you can avoid some of the myths and put time into that really active recall, asking questions, coming up with answers, and doing it with another person, you're going to set yourself up in a really great spot. So my friends, that is a wrap on tonight. I hope that was helpful. These are some tips and tricks for study and exams. Uh, if there's any, ever, any questions or anything that you would like support with, I'll put my email in here so everyone can see it, including the recording. Shoot me an email at josh at campusconsultancy.org. Um, I'm also going to save the slides and pop them in the chat. And as a bonus for anyone who watches the recording, if you get to the end of the recording, uh, shoot me an email, josh at campusconsultancy.org, and just say, hey, I watched the study exam recording. I'll send you a copy of the slides so you'll have access to them. I'd love to know that you've got through this session. Um, so for everyone who's come out tonight, thank you so much. Um, Kushi in the chat, I will share, actually I'll share the, I can't pop them in the chat with you right now for some reason, but I'll email them out with you straight after today. So if you've logged in today, I've got your email, I'll email them out. And my email is in the chat. So for any reason, you don't get the slides by the end of tonight. Um, just make sure that, oh, here we go. Ah, there we go. I scrap that i can put them in the chat that's funny uh it wasn't letting me put them in the chat for a session so just let me pop them in right now um these slides will end up in the chat beautiful they're just uploading and once they hit the chat you will have a copy perfect awesome uploading now they should be in the chat um, so just hit download. You'll have your own copy of those. If for any reason they don't come through, it's like it's taking a while to upload tonight. I'm a good little metaphor with my USB and hard drive there. For any reason they don't upload or they're not coming through, just shoot me through a quick little email uh, and I'll get them through to you. Uh, but the biggest thing after tonight is think about what are some of the key takeaways? What can you put into practice? What are some small little changes? Is it using the flashcards? Is it not doing the rereading and underlining, but instead doing active recall? Is it getting a study buddy? Is it setting a study goal every week? Is it using a calendar? Um, is it just prioritizing your sleep and well-being? All of those things will make a difference, but maybe just pick one or two of them and work on them for the next week. And I think you'll be amazed how much of an impact it has. Um, but for me, for the team, thank you so much for joining tonight. I will leave you there. I'll send the recording through so you've got access to that as well. And if it's helpful, share it with a friend. Let somebody know. Go back and re-listen to the part that you like the most. Um, pass it around. I'd absolutely like as many people to benefit as possible. Hi, John. Um, I have a quick chat question. Sure. Um, so, for example, for the having a time frame on your calendar to plan your whole day. Yep. But sometimes if I, let's just say, if I'm supposed to read, um, read a book from 4 to 4.30 and then go on to my assignment from 4.30 to, let's say, 6.30, but I was too focused on my book and I already like past the time where I have 
supposed to go on with my assignment yep. and then somebody someone would just say um okay maybe i can just keep reading for like another 30 minutes it will be fine and then the next time you realize you already passed 6 30 and that happens a lot um for me what right. would you tell yourself when you're in that situation like you right, should yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah yeah really really easy two things one everything on this calendar that you see here is digital so i can drag it so if something goes slightly longer just move the next thing a little bit down so if you're 30 minutes over and it goes for slightly longer just move the next thing down that's totally fine um, oh. second thing is if it's a big priority you, you might even move it to the next day but the other thing is the the bigger trap here is that we're spending more time on a task than you wanted to so if you going to read for an hour you're going to go on netflix for an hour or have lunch for an hour you might set a timer on your phone for 45 minutes or 50 minutes and when that goes off it's time to wrap things up so it's really important that you get the develop the skill at doing a task for the amount of time you say you're going to do it for now if you need more time schedule it for the next day or schedule it for a little later or reshuffle something but if you're in the workforce and you have a meeting that starts at midday and you started doing something at 11 and you got distracted and it's 12, 15 and you missed that meeting, that's going to have a really negative consequence, right? Like in the workforce, you, we don't just get to be distracted or go for longer than we want. So the skill set that you're developing here is if I say I'm going to do something for an hour, I'm only going to do it for an hour. Now, it doesn't mean you can't ever go over or under. That stuff's fine. But if you've got two or three big priorities in the day, I'd encourage you to make sure you hit those priorities. Like if you have to be at work at a certain time, be there. If you have to be at class at a certain time, be there. Everything else is a little bit flexible because the last thing you want to do is be sitting down all day, looking at the time, making sure you don't miss it. So three tips, use a digital calendar, move things around Two: schedule the most important things and let everything else be a little bit more flexible. And then three, if you are working on a task, set a timer or do something so you can stay committed to it. Um, so you give it the time it deserves but not so you go way over and you miss your next thing. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. All righty, guys. Well, I might wrap up and leave you there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, looking forward to seeing you again. And if you do see an event popping up in the future with Josh or Canvas Consultancy, I hope to see you there. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys.